Um, it's, my, my comments actually are, are a little bit more of a rant, uh, which is interesting because when I started reflecting on how I feel about uh, leadership in Manitoba, I found that I had some very strong feelings about this. And uh, usually I'm not allowed as a political scientist, as a professor, to sort of express my own feelings with my students. So given an opportunity, maybe I'm just getting older and crankier, I don't know, but given an opportunity, I'm going to share with you some of my thoughts. Uh, here today, so I don't have fancy slides. Uh, as I said, it's uh, more of a rant or maybe a lament. I don't know. But uh, I've been thinking about this issue of political leadership for some time now. Actually, quite even before I was invited to join this panel. And what really motivated my thoughts on this issue is what some of my colleagues here on the panel can attest to, and that's the fact that I've got first-year students. I teach at Brandon University. And we've been having some conversations in class about the debacle that's been going on in the NDP party uh, as we see a party basically uh, collapse unto itself. And, and I've been struggling with some of, some of the questions and some of the comments that they've been asking me. And, and that's really sort of triggered some of my own reflections on the issue. And, you know, if any of you have taught first years or if you remember what it's like to be in a first year university class, you know, first year students kind of remind me of young children. You know, there's a certain, they haven't learned sort of all of the opaqueness and the nasty games and the nastiness that goes on in politics. Um, they're kind of naive, right? And they sort of expect leaders will lead and the rules will be fair for everybody and things should go according to plan. And uh, they call it like they see it. And uh, so that can be both refreshing, but really disconcerting at the same time when you're trying to answer their questions. So I found that as we've been having these conversations in class and we've been watching everything unfold at the provincial level, I started questioning my own feelings about all of this. And I found that, you know, I watched uh, Richard Cloutier, who was here a month ago from CGOB, and he was when he asked about how he felt about everything that was going on. And I found that what he said really reflects my own feelings. He said, you know, I'm, I'm frustrated, I'm concerned, I'm a little bit angry, but he said most of all I'm saddened by what I see going on in Manitoba and the state of political leadership in this province. And I found that that really resonates with me because that really reflects how I feel. You know, quite honestly, I don't think anybody could look at the state of political leadership in this province and really feel that what we've been seeing is in fact an exercise in good leadership. Uh, to begin with, we have a premier that, that broke a promise to Manitobans a year ago uh, not to increase the PST, which of course he did. But then this was soon overshadowed by his stubborn refusal to do what many of us, myself included, felt was the right thing to do, both ethically and politically. And that was to step aside from the leadership of his party and the premiership of his province in the face of some rather strenuous and growing concerns, both within his own caucus as well as within his own party organization. And while we focused on the Rebel Five that came forward, sort of those cabinet ministers that came out so vociferously uh, and expressing their loss of confidence in trusting Greg Selinger, I think it's safe to say that the unhappiness within the NDP caucus go way beyond these five individuals that stepped forward. And so I started thinking about leadership and what real leadership really should be about. And for me, it's pretty clear that it's not about engaging in verbal warfare, very public verbal warfare, with members of your own team, while still trying to convince Manitobans that you have their best interests at heart. It's about listening to those around you, being accountable for your actions, and yes, when the chips are down, being prepared to take one for the team. So for me, by refusing to step aside in the face of mounting critiques, clearing the path for an interim leader to take over the premiership, and taking the lead on calling for a leadership review or even a leadership convention, I found that, for me, Greg Selinger has not only cast into doubt his own political legacy, really after so many years of sound and steady public service, but the future of his own government and party as well. And you know, my students also were quick to point out to me that even from a tactical point of view, Selinger's actions really didn't make sense. You know, they said, why didn't he sort of take the lead right from the get-go uh, when these criticisms first started coming out? And, you know, and, and he could have sort of called for his own leadership review and that would have neutralized the criticisms and perhaps he could have solidified uh, his support, never mind salvage his leadership. And for sure, no question, if he would have done so, it would have and, and called the Rebel Fives, uh, sort of uh, bluff, so to speak, um, it would have been a gamble. I mean, he could have lost an ensuing uh, leadership uh, review or leadership race, but he also could have won. And he could have neutralized his opponents, he could have reaffirmed 
uh, his, uh, his leadership, and I think he would have undermined any future attacks coming from within his own party. More importantly, he could have minimized further bloodshed within the party and increased the party's chances of holding on to power come spring of 2016. But he didn't do this. He dug in his heels, he refused to accept responsibility for the concerns that were being expressed by others, and so he only ensured that the whole ugly affair would continue to drag out and drag out and drag out in front of the public. And what ended up happening, well, he had to concede. At the end of the day, backed into a corner, when he realized that he had no choice but to, in fact, support uh, calls for a leadership uh, review convention, uh, when he had to get out of the corner that he had backed himself into, he had to concede to his critics. And as far as I'm concerned, by having to wait to the very last moment and being forced into that situation, he's irreparably damaged his own credibility. So my students ask, as well, how can a Premier be allowed to run for the very job he currently occupies? As one of them said to me, it's like trying, to, it's like trying out for a hockey team when you've already been made the captain. How is that fair? And Try the coach. <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, and I couldn't really answer that question. I couldn't disagree with uh, this. This, uh, this first year student and all of his innocence and eagerness. Um, you know, Mr. S Mr. Salinger saw no difficulty in staying on as Premier while facing an open revolt and then a leadership contest from within his own party. And I would think that being part of, uh, part of being a good leader involves making sure that the rules of the game are fair to everybody, that no one enjoys special treatment or unfair treatment, particularly when the stakes are high. Yet Salinger has steadily refused to acknowledge how running a leadership campaign out of the Premier's office not only could not give him a potentially unfair advantage over his rivals, but how it's just simply bad form. Nor could he ensure that other cabinet ministers, MLAs, and political staff would be freely allowed to support the leadership candidate of their choice without free retaliation. And for accepting this, we can also point blame to the NDP executive for exhibiting bad leadership, in my estimation. It's been challenging for the party to assure Manitobans that the Premier's not campaigning at taxpayers' expense, focusing on his personal leadership ambitions instead of running the affairs of state, which is what he was elected to do. And let's not forget that in the 2009 leadership race to replace Gary Dewar, all the candidates who were cabinet ministers at the time took leave from the ministerial duties. They did the right thing. But while we're at it, while we're pointing fingers, Let's talk about the questionable leadership being displayed by the so-called Rebel Five, those five former members of cabinet that first went public with their calls for Selinger to step down. While they all point to Selinger's apparently unilateral decision to hike the PST last year after promising not to as one of the key reasons for their revolt, they nonetheless voted in favor of the tax increase in the Manitoba legislature. And not only did they continue to publicly defend the tax hike in the aftermath, but they remained on as members of caucus, and more importantly as cabinet ministers, for seven months afterwards. Were the dissidents motivated solely by fears of the party losing the next election and losing their own seats in the process? If they had deep policy disagreements with the Premier on the PST and other issues, and they, as they have repeatedly said, why didn't they do the honorable thing and resign earlier? By openly attacking the leadership of the Premier, the Gang of Five violated one of the most fundamental principles of Westminster democracy, namely collective ministerial responsibility and cabinet solidarity. At the same time, as Paul Thomas points out, my colleague, what democratic principle justifies their attempt to displace a party leader who won two-thirds of the votes at the NDP's last leadership convention in 2009 and who led the party to a record majority of seats in the 2011 election? So across the board, then, I don't see good examples of good leadership from this current government, nor, quite frankly, am I particularly optimistic when I look to Manitoba's two other provincial parties. And my sense is that the public feels this way and is hungering for more when they look at our leaders in Manitoba. Certainly when we look at how the leadership race is panning out within the NDP, we see some evidence of this. The, su the supposed advantage that many thought Greg Selinger would enjoy as a sitting premier does not seem to be bearing out. Depending on whose delegate counts you, you accept, he's either in second or in third place behind the front runner Steve Ashton. At the same time, Theresa Oswald's best efforts to put a positive cast on her actions as one of the rebel five, uh, that, um, the fact that she's not in, a good, in first place either means that some party members do not look to her as being an example of good, positive leadership. 
And in terms of the larger public, some of the frustration I've been hearing in the coffee shops and call-in radio shows across the province might be attributed, for sure, to the public's lack of understanding about how the Westminster system operates, how our parties basically set their own rules. People are astounded to learn that approximately 2,000 party delegates at a leadership convention, representing less than 0.002% of the population in the province, will be in charge of selecting our next Premier. Or the fact that there are no formal mechanisms for a cabinet and caucus to remove the leader of a governing party. Or even the fact that it's the party executive itself, a very small body, that decides for itself what the rules are of a leadership contest. Now in case you think I'm just simply picking on the NDP, I would advance that really we see a lack of leadership with both the Liberals and the PCs. Certainly the Liberals, as we know, those of us that follow the news, have long been wracked by internecine and battles um, over leadership. We've seen all kinds of, of factions and coups happening within the party and key figures departing over, over leadership issues. And certainly the Conservative Party, which I have studied for many years, is no better. In fact, as one of my Conservatives friends says, hey, we're progressive Conservatives, we like to eat our own. So, right across the board, I don't think Manitobans really are getting the good leadership that they want and they deserve. And so this brings me to my sadness over the whole issue. Uh, this sounds a little corny, but when I think of my job as a professor, I'm kind of a missionary. I'm on a mission to get young people engaged and excited about politics. To spark that light in them so they want to join parties, vote in elections, run for office, care about what's going on in the political world around them. I want them to see public service as an honorable and desirable calling. And I'm not sure how to stem the cynicism and mistrust that they're already feeling at 18 years of age when they look at our current crop of leaders. I don't know how to answer their questions and how to get them excited and build trust in, in the party system. As one of my students said recently, the X factor of great leadership is not personality, it's humility. A little more humility and a little less hubris a little more public service, a little less personal interest on the part of our political leaders in Manitoba, I think, would go a long way to making my job easier. Thank you.